Pizzeria Simulator's AI has always been shrouded in mystery, likely in part because half the game is trying to figure out where they even are. Where's the homies? No, I didn't know what side he was. But past that, of all the games in the series, I don't think I've seen quite as much misinformation as there is about FFPS. Even the official Freddy files in Ultimate Guide have blatantly wrong information. And for that reason, this video will be comprehensive in exploring every section of the game, including the office, salvage, and simulator sections, as well as ending requirements. Feel free to pause or rewind particularly dense parts of the video, closed captions are provided, and without further ado, let's get on with it. In case you haven't played before or have forgotten in the nearly six years since it came out, in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator, the main gameplay has you in a cramped room with oddly large ventilation shafts on your left and right that you can shine your flashlight in. You also have a couple tools to monitor the vents and room temperature, but before I go over anything else, I need to explain what we need to do. Tasks. No, not those ones. Pizzeria tasks. Before you can end your shift, you've got three different categories of tasks we need to complete every day. There are five supply tasks that take 8.4 seconds each, three advertising tasks that take 16.7 seconds each, and three maintenance tasks that take 12.5 seconds each. You can use the money gained in the pizzeria simulator portion of the game to purchase upgrades that decrease how much time it takes for each of these tasks by a decent amount, 20%. In addition, the 2 times printer upgrade replaces the old dot matrix printing sound with a less jarring laser printer sound, and the high speed uplink upgrade just removes the dial up sounds altogether. Alright, great. Sounds like this won't be a problem if there is nothing in the vents. Oh, no. Yep, of course. Animatronics can get into your pizzeria's vents, and to put it lightly, don't like it when you are also there. The animatronics start in a random room on the top and have the ability to move at a certain interval, what we call movement opportunities. Thankfully, the odds are pretty simple in this game. It's just the third chance to move at each opportunity, and those odds don't change. What does change is how often they get these movement opportunities. On night one, they only have an opportunity every eight seconds, and only if the tutorial isn't playing, which means you're at a little higher risk if you mute it, but you can do that if you think it's a piss off. They get a lot quicker though, getting movement opportunities every 5 seconds on night 2, every 4 seconds on night 3, every 3 seconds on night 4, every 2.5 seconds on night 5, and every 2 seconds on night 6. There is also a special monotony mechanic that becomes active on nights 3 and onwards. It counts how many seconds it's been since you last turned, and if it's been 30 seconds, the characters will start having movement opportunities every 2 seconds, regardless of what night it is. And if it's been 45 seconds, the characters will start having movement opportunities every second. You just need to turn to reset this, and you have to be doing nothing for a whole 30 or 45 seconds, but you do see some people encounter it when they get really scared, and this mechanic definitely doesn't help them with that. Alright, so we know when they might move, but where? It gets a little complicated when you just look at the map. There are no set paths here, they just go wherever they want. Looking at the chances to move into rooms, it's pretty difficult to predict where an animatronic will go at any point. But the general idea is similar to Springtrap in FNAF 3, in that they can move backwards, but they're more likely to move down and towards you. It's also just barely not symmetrical, so use that information for what you will. There are some utilities you can use to deter or track them, but the most key information you will get in this game are the vent noises. Vent noises are panned to your left and right, depending on which side the vent noise is coming from. However, if you're looking at a vent and it's in front of you, you'll hear it in both ears. If it's behind you, you'll hear it on the opposite ear, on the right if you're looking to the left and vice versa. There's a unique set of quiet vent noises for when an animatronic enters or leaves the rooms beside you like this. And there's a separate set of loud vent noises for when an animatronic enters or leaves the vent beside you. And also a third chance every 3 seconds that an animatronic is still in the vent. It will also play when they've got you, which can't be too helpful considering you die if you turn, or at 5 second intervals. 
But if it's any consolation, you can't get any ads. There are also voice lines you can hear if one of the animatronics is in one of the adjacent rooms after one minute into the night. Fascinating what they have become. They can each only do it once on each side in the night, though you can't tell which side they're on from the voice line itself, it isn't panned. Now there's one final regular movement method for the animatronics, and maybe the FNAF 3 Springtrap analogy was a bit on the nose, because these animatronics can also vent. They're already in the vents, but they can teleport once a night. By 10 seconds into the night, when Molten Freddy is in the top middle room for the first time, he will instantly teleport to your adjoining left room. By 20 seconds into the night, when Scrap Trap or Scrap Baby are in the top middle room, they will instantly teleport to your adjoining right room. Lefty does not do this, not because of his conscience stopping him or anything, but due to an off by one error on the IDs of the animatronics. The IDs go up to 5, but the vent teleportation mechanic covers IDs 1 to 4, but no animatronic fills the first ID. There is, though, one hint in the code as to what the first ID could have meant. The game stores whether you have an animatronic in your pizzeria with MIDs, and the first one is only set to 1 if you accept all the sponsorships. But unfortunately, no ad monster or anything exists, and all of their code for it was removed by release, so this is the only real remnant left. Now moving on to the thing that determines if you're gonna die, sound. Not vent noises, but the sound the player is making while progressing in the night. You don't want the animatronics to hear you, of course, but in order to win, you have to be vulnerable. You always have a 10% chance of being heard, but while turning on the fan or computer, they each increase that chance by 20%, and by 40% once they finish turning on. That darned printing noise while doing an advertising task increases that risk by 20%, and having an ad blaring also increases that risk by 20%. So why does it matter if they hear you? It's specifically for if a character is in one of your adjacent vents and moves. If they happen to hear you and you're not shining a light in the vent, you're gonna die. If they can hear you but you have the light on them, they'll retreat to the corner room. And if they can't hear you, they move back up, no light required. Your flashlight is also more useful if you're making no noise at all. If you have everything off, then you can clear animatronics in both the vent and room beside you when shining your flashlight into the vents, forcing them all the way to the top corners at 4 second intervals. And we're finally now at our utilities. We've got three, the motion detector, the audio lure, and silent ventilation. You can only use one utility at a time, and turning off the computer or getting an ad will turn off the motion detector or audio lure. Silent ventilation, however, will persist. The motion detector is pretty simple. It just shows whenever an animatronic moves and also plays a sound, useful to get your bearings and plan out your next moves. The audio lure is oddly similar in that it shows any animatronic movements within the audio range. As well, if your audio is overlapping a character and it tries to move, it has a 50% chance to just move directly to the audio signal, playing this sound. If it doesn't get fooled by the audio signal, it will play a slightly different sound. Finally, we have silent ventilation, which is a secondary ventilation system in addition to your normal fan particularly useful because it doesn't turn off when the other utilities would. Every second that silent ventilation is on, there's a 50% chance to decrease the temperature, if it's above 70. This perfectly matches how often the temperature will go up if you have everything turned off. Specifically, if the fan is off, the temperature has a 50% chance to go up every second if the computer's off, and half a second if the computer's on. However, if the fan is on, the temperature has a 50% chance to go down every 0.4 seconds if the computer's off, and every 0.5 seconds if the computer's on. The temperature mechanic is a decent addition to put the pressure on when you're in danger, as you die at 120 degrees. Because it keeps going up without the fan, it almost forces you to use silent ventilation before turning off the computer if you want to consistently survive on the harder nights. The final bit I must mention are ads. During the Pizzeria Simulator portion of the game, you can accept sponsorships in exchange for a generous sum of money. But during the office sections, each ad has a 25% chance to be queued at 20 second intervals. Then, whenever you're next looking at the screen, an ad will advertise. Once a specific ad is played, you won't see it again that night. 
though if multiple get queued at once, one will override the others and you just won't see some during the night. Alright, so maybe the night isn't that simple, but at least all the characters act mostly the same, and I promise you, the other sections do not contain teleportation. After each night, you have the opportunity to salvage an animatronic. It just happens that that animatronic will also get into your pizzeria and become an enemy in the future office sections, but who cares about that when you can get some of that cold, hard cash up to $5,000? This is only the case though if the animatronic hasn't already gotten into your pizzeria by any other means. Your goal during the interrogation, as it's called in the files, is to play five audio prompts to test the animatronic's reactions, and also not die. You also cannot progress to the next audio prompt unless you've looked at the page in the last 10 seconds. You don't have to cross out anything, the page is just to facilitate jump scares. You do have a taser with you to reset the animatronics to a neutral state, though after four tases you only get half the salvage money, and anything five and above gets you a measly $100. The salvage is used an aggression meter, which when starting the interrogation starts randomly at either 0 or 100. For every 10 seconds that the tape plays, there's a 50% chance for aggression to increase by 150 plus 50 times the night number. For every second that you look at your page, the aggression increases by 10 plus 10 times the night number. There's also a 50% chance that when starting the fourth prompt, it will bring up aggression to 750, but won't decrease aggression if it's already above that. The animatronic will attack once it reaches 1200 aggression, or when you flip down the page at or above 1000 aggression. There are a couple ways to gauge how aggressive the animatronic is, primarily if it is moved. The salvage is swapped to the next visual stage when their aggression has reached 250, and the next at 500, though they will only move when you're looking at the page for at least a frame. I generally just look out for the last stage and consistently flip the page to make sure it updates. For Molten Freddy, I just look for a hole in the shadow. For Scrap Trap, I check if he's bearing teeth. Scrap Baby's eye is only visible on her last stage, and Lefty's star, being fully in shadow, is his tell. There is also a very subtle audio cue with unique sounds for each animatronic. Molten Freddy has some popping and clicks. Scrap Trap has a droning heartbeat. Scrap Baby has metallic rattling. And Lefty has some wind up whirring. Keep in mind though that these sounds are incredibly quiet, only at 3 volume after 750 aggression and 5 volume after 900. During an audio prompt, this is what it sounds like. So the best way to utilize this is to either pause the prompt if you suspect something, or listen for sounds after a prompt ends, but before bringing up the page. Using the taser is your only way to reduce this aggression, and it resets it to a random 100 from 0 to 300 aggression. And that's it. Sorry, I just need to get that off my chest. You get it. Anyways, what were we doing? Oh yeah, a simulator game. With the money you earn, you can buy animatronics, attractions, accessories, and more to upgrade your pizzeria and earn even more money. You start with only Dumpster Diving Weekly unlocked, and unlock Stan's Budget Tech after spending $100. You unlock Smiles and Servos Inc. after spending a total of $1,000 and unlock the Rare Finds auction after spending $3,000. You might have noticed some items are unavailable, oftentimes the animatronics. If you don't have the appropriate stage for them, you can't even purchase them. But there are a few other items with specific requirements. The confetti tile floor is not purchasable if your floor plan is not fully upgraded, and the same for the star curtain stage, though you also need to purchase the deluxe concert stage beforehand. And pickles, though purportedly requiring you to purchase every single item in the game, only requires the posh pizzeria achievement. 
There are four achievements, including Trash in the Gang, Mediocre Melodies, Rockstars Assemble, and the aforementioned Posh Pizzeria. They're each obtained by placing a full set of animatronics on the stage and reward a decent amount of money. Posh Pizzeria, though, despite being incredibly expensive, is the only one that doesn't reward any money, though an unused image reveals it may have once been intended to reward $30,000. Something you can use to alleviate those costs are markdowns. Every day after the first one, five discounts get distributed to random items in the catalog. Items that are not marked down have a very good condition, but items that have one of these discounts have worse conditions. Every day there is a discount for only good condition, for poor condition, very poor condition, and two for terrible condition. Unfortunately, these discounts might be on items that aren't accessible to you yet, or that you've already bought or depreciated. And the same item can have multiple discounts, which just ends up using the largest markdown. Good quality markdowns are only half the price, poor are a third, very poor are a quarter, and terrible quality items are only a fifth of the price. As well, the worse the quality, the more liability you gain from the item, if it's a placeable attraction or an animatronic or as a speaker set, which are the only non-placeable items that can have liability, for whatever reason. If it's not one of those, buying the markdown item just saves you money. There's no hidden liability or chance that an animatronic will get into your pizzeria. Before I get into how you generally get money, I need to introduce a small little bonus you can do before the game even starts. Found my channel mainstay full make if you design an onions, mushroom, olives, and peppers pizza. After completing the tutorial, you will start with an extra $100. Unfortunately, you can't do this from a new game that skips the 8-bit minigame stuff. The only way you can get to that is if it's the first time you open the game, or after your save is deleted from bankruptcy, or after you deleted the save by holding dash. But the main way you get money is by playtesting your attractions. You get 10 play tokens every day and can spend them on playing any of the attractions you've placed down. Except for Egg Baby, truly a missed opportunity. Uh, yeah. Anyways, you increase your FAS rating by however much score you gain in the minigame. For every 1000 total FAS rating, you get $100. I won't explain the scoring systems for most of the games, it shows it in the top corner, but some of the games are RNG based or have secret scoring. For example, the ducks in the duck pond are worth 100 score 81% of the time, worth 500 score 18% of the time, and worth 900 score 1% of the time. Balloon cart balloons are worth a random number from 1 to 5, multiplied by 1000, so from 1000 to 5000 rating, and candy cadets candies are worth a random number from 1 to 8, multiplied by 250, so from 250 to 2000 rating, and each one of his three stories have a 1% chance of being chosen, which give an additional 5,000 rating. And the puppet minigame gives no rating, except for the fourth attempt, which gives 25,000. Finally, the two infamous lottery minigames, The Ball Pit Tower and Prize King, are must-buys if you want to even have a chance of being able to assemble the posh pizzeria set. Though not because of the money, but because you can directly get two of the animatronics. They're guaranteed on the 10th play, and don't worry, it doesn't have to be all on the same day. The only other ways to gain FAS rating outside of playtesting are buying one of the attraction upgrades, which only gives 50 each, or placing down an attraction or animatronic for the first time. Attractions give 25 times the number they have here, and animatronics give 100 times the number they have here. It's not a ton, but anything helps. And before I get to lawsuits and ending requirements, I need to talk about your stats. You gain money at the end of the night based on what attractions, animatronics, and accessories you have in your restaurant. The exact random calculations will be shown on the screen, but all you need to pay attention to is the average. Your atmosphere and entertainment determine how many visitors you attract, though there is a limit based on your floor plan. 50 by default, 100 with an upgrade, and 500 if maxed. If you attract more visitors than the room can provide for, then they get turned away and you lose out on all that money. Then, based on how many visitors you get, you earn food and bonus revenue. 
health and safety and risk aren't factored into these revenue calculations, but they do determine whether you get sued or have animatronics sneak into the pizzeria. You start with 3 default risk and health and safety decreases your total risk. Every time you start a night for the first time, each of the 4 animatronics has a total risk at a 50 chance of getting into the restaurant, even on night 1. The game doesn't tell you if an animatronic or two gets in your pizzeria, you're just gonna have to find out. But it will tell you about the lawsuits. Each night, you can get up to 3 new lawsuits. Like with the animatronics, each of those three possible lawsuits has a total risk at a 50 chance of occurring. But it's actually slightly different. It happens to be a risk minus one out of 50 chance. Which I think is a mistake because it means you can't get lawsuits on one risk. But of the lawsuits you do receive, they each get a random severity from 1 to 10. Each severity having their own unique lawsuit text. You have two options, settling and fighting the lawsuit. Settling costs 100 times the severity, while fighting it only costs half as much, plus $25. You don't have to deal with settled lawsuits again, but fighting lawsuits only has a 20% chance of working, and only if you didn't get any new lawsuits the next day. Though due to an error, you only have a 20% chance of winning if it's the first page. The mistake doesn't allow you to win two lawsuits in a row, and it checks for wins even on settled and already won lawsuits, so you only truly have a 16% chance to win a lawsuit if it's not the first one. And as we reach the end of this video, we now cover the endings. This game has 6 certificates and 6 endings. You get the bad ending if you did not have all the animatronics in your pizzeria by night 6 and had more than 0 faz rating. If you didn't have any faz rating though, which you can do by never placing down any animatronics or attractions, you get the mediocrity ending and certificate. You can also end your game by going bankrupt, which is possible if you run out of money while dealing with lawsuits, giving you the bankruptcy ending and certificate, and also deleting your save because of your financial incompetence. Of course, it'd be crazy to forget Insanity, which is only accessible if you've bought the Egg Baby Data Archive attraction, though not necessarily placed it down. When in the office, you'll notice that the computer button is blue, and if you turn off the computer, hold left click on that button, and turn the computer back on, you'll see some things you were not meant to see, giving you both the it's Insanity totally Certificate, the and a free trip to the Insane Asylum. Now, Blacklisted has been the topic of much confusion as to how you access it. It's not related to getting a certain number of lawsuits, or purchasing specific markdown items, or any other special condition, you just need to finish night 6 with 50 or more total risk. Now getting lawsuits or purchasing markdown items will probably happen during the run, but there's just a byproduct, you only need the 50 risk at the end to get the blacklisted ending and certificate. And the completion ending and certificate just requires that all animatronics are in your pizzeria, whether by salvaging, by chance from risk, or placing down lefty. You also need less than 50 risk, of course. Finally, the Lore Keeper Certificate is a little special, in that you don't need to end the game at all. You just need to experience all three playtest minigame secrets. One in the Fruity Maze if you beat it twice, and play it a third time. One in Midnight Motorist after going through a hole in the bottom of the road and completing that section. And one in the Security Puppet minigame if you play it four times. The certificate also allows you to see the infamous graves on a hill after the credits of the completion ending. And that's everything I could reasonably explain in this video. There are a few spreadsheets in the description or info card here with statistics and maps if you want to reference them while playing the game or want to optimize your simulator experience. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for the support on the previous videos, it's been super cool to be able to showcase how the games work to a nearly uncountable number of people. I've got a couple more videos down the road that I'm really liking so far, not a game breakdown but more so oddities and such, so subscribe if this genre, if you can call it that, is your type of thing. And I'll end it off with a request from Fulmic. Play Ladder Tower. It's not a great game, has bad stats, and isn't good for score, but no one plays it and it's lonely. Oh, and that's the video ending.